Good morning, FBC. Uh, it is great that we get to be together like this. Uh, we are looking forward to when we can all get together again in person, but uh, we are certainly blessed by the Lord to be able to have this. Well, my name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC, and um, I want to say welcome to everyone who is joining us. Fellowship Bible Church is a church filled with people whose lives are being transformed because they have come to know Christ and they are getting to know him better and experiencing him more in their lives. And that is exactly what we want for you. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time online, we certainly hope that you feel at home, uh, even as you probably are at home, but we hope this is a, a welcome place for you and we are delighted that you are here. Uh, you can text WELCOME to the number that's on the screen, and that will allow you to get more information about FBC. Uh, we'll get back to you with more information in a way that we can connect and get to know you better, and you get to know us better, and we hope we have that opportunity. Well, today's Mother's Day, and uh, Mother's Day is usually a big deal around here, celebrated with lots of chocolate. And of course, this year was, uh, is going to be different. It was highly controversial with the staff as to whether or not we wanted to give out chocolate or see if we can just keep it for ourselves. But wiser heads prevailed, and uh, we are going to be thrilled to celebrate Mother's Day with you with a drive-through celebration. And so from 2 to 4 o'clock today, you can come up to the church and in front of the building where the offices are, that's the building closest to the fire station, we will have a little area set up where you can just come on in uh, in your car. You don't have to get out of your car. And we will uh, pass on that chocolate to you. And I believe we also are arranging to have a flower for you. And we would love for anyone who's a mother, a grandmother, or a mother at heart uh, to allow us to at least say thank you and, um, and celebrate that with you. Uh, today. We also want to celebrate what God has been doing with us here at FBC. He has been providing for us financially in wonderful ways. Uh, we're so excited. We never would have thought about this when uh, this whole virus started, but uh, as of today, all of our expenses are being covered financially, and that is a real testimony to the faithfulness of the Lord. Uh, we also want to let you know that uh, we have received uh, money from the payroll protection program that the federal government has done, and that is also going to cover the payroll for the staff uh, for a few weeks, which again is a huge, huge blessing. And uh, we just need to go before the Lord and thank him for how he is providing. Now, uh, you are also as a congregation just faithfully and wonderfully continuing to support FBC, and we want to encourage you to continue to do so. Uh, it's important for FBC, but it's also important as an act of worship. And there are a number of ways that you can continue to do that, even as we are at home. Uh, certainly, you can do that through the website. Uh, if you have the phone app, you can do that there. Or you can do what's called text to give. And uh, you can text uh, your gift, your, your offering to 77977, and uh, that goes to continue to support FBC. Let me also note that we have had a wonderful response to the request to, to bolster up our um, benevolence fund, and that benevolence fund goes to people who are in need uh, in our congregation, and uh, of course, this is a time where people can certainly be at need. So, I mention that because I want to encourage you. If you have a need, would you please let us know? We want to support you and uh, help you in any way that we can. I mentioned earlier that we're looking forward to opening up, and I want to, I'm very excited to let you know that we are tentatively, and that's tentative needs to be in all caps there, but we are tentatively planning on May 24th. Now, we are working on the details of what that is going to actually look like, uh, but we know that it will, will start with just the Sunday morning service. And then as restrictions are loosened up by the government, we are going to add on more ministries on that Sunday morning. Uh, and we will do everything that we need to do to ensure uh, that people stay socially distanced and uh, that we have a, a very safe and sanitized environment for you to come into uh, but uh, continue to pray that May 24th is actually a reality, uh, 
Uh, if things look like they take a bad turn within the community and the virus gets out of hand or something, we will certainly uh, make the decision that we need to to protect you. I also want to acknowledge uh, this morning that there is a lot on Facebook and a lot in the media about the killing of Ahmad Arbery, and he's a young boy or a young man, a 25-year-old man in Georgia who was murdered, and it certainly looks like it was uh, racially motivated. And it, I want us to acknowledge, even though that that is so far from us distance-wise, and it's, um, it's easy for us to treat this as just something that's on the news, but it is appropriate for us as Christians that our hearts are broken anytime we see injustice of any form. And uh, my prayer for this situation is that God's justice would be made evident, whatever that looks like. I don't know the facts of the case, but I certainly know that we should pray for his justice. We need to pray for uh, all of the families that are involved, that they would be comforted in a time of grief and a time of tension. And ultimately, we need to pray that God is glorified through all of this. You know, it is a reminder um, a tragic event like that, and honestly, so is the, the virus, a reminder that we live in a broken world that is ripped apart by sin. And we need to be encouraged by Jesus' words to his disciples uh, during, during the time of the Last Supper as he is preparing to leave as the disciples, although they don't fully know it, uh, are going to be prepared to face a fallen and broken world without Jesus' physical presence. Jesus told them this, peace I, live, I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Those are words of comfort that Jesus gives to his disciples and by extension gives to us. Let not your heart be troubled. The peace that we find in Christ supersedes anything that we find in a broken and sinful world. We look forward this morning to uh, celebrating how God continues to care for us. We're going to do that through song. We're going to do that through uh, the word that Slade is going to share with us this morning. And uh, we are grateful that we find peace in Christ and through Christ. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday, a wonderful Mother's Day, and we will connect with you again soon. Walking away, wait for the walls to fall.
mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious song and sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain fix upon it mount of god's redeeming love Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come. And I hope I, thy good pleasure, safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me as a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. He too me from danger interposed his precious blood oh to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal Seal it for thy courts of love. Hello. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Slade Reinhardt. I oversee our youth ministry and our adult Connect and Grow ministries here at Fellowship Bible Church. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my privilege today to bring to you the 11th sermon in our sermon series going through the book of Romans called Live by Faith. In fact, you can go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 6, verse 15, just to get in uh, preparation for me reading the Scripture a little bit later. On the night of July 13, 1977, there was an electrical storm that caused a blackout across all five boroughs of New York City. When power was restored 25 hours later, arsonists had set over 1,000 fires and looters had ransacked, ransacked over 1,600 businesses. Now, <clears throat> think about that scene. It was so wild that the New York Post actually said that the looters were even being mugged. Thieves were taking everything they could lay their hands on, from luxury cars to clothespins. <clears throat> and what was it that caused that? Why would a blackout suddenly cause this spike in criminal activity? Well, I think all of us know exactly why that is, and that's that these criminals knew that the police couldn't enforce the laws during this blackout. They couldn't be seen, they couldn't be identified, and so they couldn't be caught. So because there was no legal threat against their actions, they were free to pursue whatever dark desires they had. Now that's a perfect example of human nature, isn't it? As long as there's not the threat of some bad consequence, we'll choose the wrong thing. And that can even be true for children of God. In the second half of Romans chapter 6, Paul addresses this very, ten very tendency in the people of God so, as I mentioned before, look at Romans chapter 6, and I'm going to be reading verses 15 through 23. It says this, What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were com committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now 
present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Last week, our lead pastor, Todd Malone, preached through the first half of Romans chapter 6. It was Paul's answer to the question of sinning in order to evoke or bring about or generate the grace of God. <clears throat> the question was, are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? Paul answered, no. Those that trust in Christ are united to Him in His death and resurrection. And just as Christ is dead to sin, you are now dead to sin. And sin cannot have any dominion over you because you are, you're dead to it. Now, beginning in 15, verse 15, he moves on to another topic. He asks a second question and again fleshes out an answer. So let's take a look. The passage begins with the antinomian question. The antinomian question. Antinomianism is the belief that Christians are free from the moral obligations of God's law since we are saved by faith alone. In practice, antinomianism is more of a tendency to disregard the place of God's commands in a believer's life. Hey, I'm justified by faith, not works, so I can live however, however I want. Paul, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, anticipated this attitude. Look at verse 15 again. What then? Are we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? The question Paul asked is an anticipation, excuse me, is a direct response to what he said in verse 14. For sin shall have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, under grace. Which naturally led to the question, Oh, are we to sin, since we are not under law, but under grace? Since there's no legal threat against those of us in Christ, aren't we free to pursue sin? At the beginning of chapter 6, Paul addressed the person whose sinful tendency is to pretend that their sin is actually glorifying to God. <clears throat> Here in verse 15, he's addressing the person whose sinful tendency is to think that God's grace means that His rules don't matter to them, since they aren't saved by keeping those rules, nor are they condemned for breaking those rules. Since there's a blackout and the police won't arrest us, aren't we free to loot and burn is kind of the question. Now, maybe this tendency has cropped up in your mind before. I'll live however I want, since God won't punish me. I think really it's natural for anyone who understands that forgiveness and righteousness are given to us by faith apart from our works, meaning apart from our obedience. Our sin nature takes advantage of that grace of God and puts in our minds the idea that it really doesn't matter how we live. It really doesn't matter if we sin. I'll live however I want since God won't punish me. You might think all my sin, past, present, and future has been paid for. I won't be punished by God now or in the future. I'm not judged by the standard of the law. I live under grace. I can sin with abandon. That's the kind of logic that our sin nature drives us to. You've been struggling with lust for years and you get tired of fighting it. So you start thinking, maybe I don't need to fight it. I'm forgiven anyway. I'll just give up. You have a habit of lying to get what you want, to make yourself look better, or to win friends. You feel ashamed of it and you don't like feeling ashamed. So you decide you don't need to feel ashamed. You just carry on knowing that God's grace covers you. Now, if these two examples sound repugnant to you, they should, because Paul's answer to this question is exactly the answer that he gave in verse 1. Absolutely not. He said, by no means, or may it never be. You cannot use the grace of God as a cloak or as, a, or as an excuse to sin. You are not to sin simply because you are under grace and not under law. Living in God's grace does not give you license to sin. So the short answer to the antinomian question is no. But then Paul goes on to flesh out a couple of bigger answers to help us understand what's going on. The first answer is this. Your status has changed. Your status has changed. Paul begins this answer by helping us see the antinomian question more clearly. Look again with me at verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, 
you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. The question on the table is whether we're free to sin since we're under grace and not law. Paul begins unpacking his negative answer by framing it as an issue of status or identity. When you yield to sin, you're actually presenting yourself to sin as its slave. Now, in that day, people would often choose to become a slave of their own free will because they would be provided for and sometimes given education and training. Now, I know that that sounds repugnant and horrible to us, but that was the reality of life in the Roman Empire. Slavery was often a viable option for someone who is a, a poorer member of society. And when you agreed to become someone's slave, you presented yourself to them as their slave. I, you now own me, at least for a period of time. <clears throat> I am yours to command. God is saying that by yielding to sin, giving sin free reign in your life, that is the same as presenting yourself or offering yourself to sin as its slave. In John 8, 34, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin, and slavery to sin leads to death. On the other hand, presenting yourself or yielding to obedience to God is like putting yourself under God as your master, and that leads to righteousness. So God is telling us that the question, are we to sin since we are not under law but under grace, should be rephrased. In actuality, the question should be stated this way, will I be a slave to sin or will I be a slave to righteousness? And then Paul gives the death stroke to this antinomian question. Your change in status has already answered the question. Look at verses 17 and 18. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Thank God that you were set free from sin. You were by nature a slave of sin. That was your status. It was inescapable. You were going to obey sin. But when you trusted in Christ, your status changed to slave of righteousness. Verse 17 says that believers have become obedient from the heart to that standard of teaching to which they were committed. Everyone who is a child of God has obeyed His command to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The standard of teaching refers to the truths about Christ that form the faith, who Jesus is and what He's done. These Roman Christians had obeyed these truths by responding in faith, and that caused a change in their status. Colossians 1, 13 and 14 says that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. A child of God lives in the kingdom of Christ. A child of God is a slave of righteousness. You aren't free to sin because giving yourself to sin isn't freedom. It's a return to the slavery that you've been delivered from. You renounced your sin when you came to Jesus. So the question of presenting yourself as a slave to sin isn't valid any longer. If you were still enslaved to sin and the punishment for sin was removed, you would yield yourself wholeheartedly to sin. But you aren't. You're free from sin's reign and now under the reign of God. You aren't one of those looters in New York who discovered that all the law enforcement officers left town. You are God's slave, the God who sent His Son to die for you, the God who pursued you when you were rebelling against Him. You were a slave to the cruel master named Sin, but you were delivered from that master to a loving, caring master, your Heavenly Father. When you find yourself tempted to yield to sin since you are under grace, return to this promise of God. You're free from sin and you are a slave to righteousness. Sin does not have dominion over you. It is not your Lord. Jesus is your Lord. And just so you don't misunderstand, that doesn't mean that you won't sin. The late S. Lewis Johnson explained it this way, This slavery to righteousness is not such that a believer cannot sin, but he cannot sin in the manner of the unregenerate, that is, completely and without sorrow and shame. Now, after reminding us of our status change, Paul then tells us to live out of that status. Look at verse 19 again. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. 
For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Paul almost apologetically says that he used this slavery analogy because it's easier for them to understand. The truth, of course, is that living under the Lordship of Christ is not slavery, but is in fact perfect freedom because the redeemed heart desires righteousness. The redeemed heart desires to be more like Christ. The redeemed heart desires to bring glory and honor to God. But he needed to use this analogy that was more easily grasped by our worldly minds. And so returning to that analogy again, he says we should present ourselves as slaves to righteousness. Since you are a slave of righteousness, live as a slave of righteousness. Since your status is free from sin, enslaved to God, live free from sin and enslaved to God. When you were an unbeliever, you freely gave yourself, your members, the various aspects of your person to impurity and lawlessness. In the same way, now give yourself to righteousness. Think about your life outside of Christ. You presented yourself as sin slave by joyfully and enthusiastically giving in to temptations like lust or greed or pride, hatred or slander. You thought about sin. You, <clears throat> you planned sin. You put yourself in positions where you would sin. Do the same thing with righteousness. Think about righteousness. Plan doing works of righteousness. Put yourself in positions where you are going to uh, give in to righteousness. Once we meet in person again, join with the body of Christ in corporate worship. Serve someone in need. Spend time in private prayer. Read God's Word. That's how you present your members as slaves to righteousness. And this is very important. The power to live as a slave of righteousness is not our own. The power to present your members to righteousness comes from the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit indwells every believer and He strengthens and guides and urges and encourages us to live in righteousness. You are slaves of righteousness and you are slaves of God. You have been set free from sin. Those things are true of you. That is your status. So now live in a way that makes sense with that status. Live consistently with that new status. That's why you can't give yourself to sin. This is why you can't simply say, I'm going to yield my life to sin and live with abandon. I'm going to allow myself to be enslaved by sin because your status has changed. That also means that if you haven't trusted in Christ, you are a slave to sin. It is only in union with Christ that you're set free from sin. And that union only exists between Jesus and those who have put their trust in Him. If you're struggling under the weight of guilt and shame and trying with all your might to pay for your sin or atone for it in some way, I encourage you to turn to Jesus. Confess your sinfulness, ask His forgiveness, and believe that His death paid the penalty that your sin deserves. The second answer that Paul gives to the question of sinning, since we are under grace and not under law, is this. Consider the fruit. Consider the fruit. To finish up his response to the antinomian question, Paul helps us think about what yielding to sin produces versus what yielding to righteousness produces. Look again at verses 20 to 23. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Before you came to Christ, you were a slave of sin. You didn't submit to God's commands. You were free from His mastery. You were free in regard to righteousness, the way Paul puts it. And what did that produce in your life? For one thing, it produced shame. Now that you know Christ and see Him as righteous and glorious and beautiful, you're ashamed of the sinful things that you've done. And if you're ashamed of it, why would you even consider yielding to it again? And remember that the end product of slavery to sin is death, spiritual death now and spiritual death forever for those who are slaves of sin. <clears throat> 
Does it make any sense to want to go back to this lifestyle whose end is death, and it, which leads to shame? Of course not. Now, what about the fruit of being a slave of God? You are led to sanctification or holiness. You are being made into the image of Christ. The fruit of being a slave of God includes receiving and experiencing and giving love and joy and peace. And the end of being a slave of God is eternal life, experiencing eternal life now and then being eternally with God experiencing that eternal life. Verse 23 summarizes it very neatly, and as you know, it's often used to explain the gospel to someone because it covers so much of the truth. The bottom line is that sin does pay. It pays the wage of death. Those who yield to sin earn death. Death is what sin deserves. God, on the other hand, doesn't pay those who yield to Him. He gives them something absolutely free, and that is eternal life in Christ. Theologian William Shedd writes this, Righteousness, unlike sin, is not self-originated, and consequently its reward must be gracious. In other words, the reward of yielding to righteousness must be given to us by God as a grace, a gift. It can't be earned, because it's only by God's initiative and God's strength that any of us does yield to righteousness. Yielding to sin, that's our doing, and we earn its wages. Yielding to righteousness... That's the work of God, and He gives us His free gift of life on top of that. <clears throat> if you're tempted to give in to sin since you're not under law, look at the generosity and the grace and the beauty of God who freely gives life to you through His Son, Jesus Christ. Set your mind on what He's done for you. Focus on the truth that Jesus of Nazareth, the one perfect man in all of human history, gave His blood to redeem your life to deliver you from slavery to sin and ultimately bring you into eternal life with Him. And then use your gratitude toward the Lord as fuel to pursue being a slave of righteousness, as fuel to fight against sin. Here's the thrust of this passage. You are slaves of God. Don't live like slaves of sin. Now, having said that, I recognize, as I mentioned earlier, that all of us do still yield to sin. All of us do give in. Every believer disobeys God in a thousand ways, giving in to pride, anger, slander, lust, greed, cowardice. And God, of course, is not naive to that fact. The thrust of this passage is not that only perfect people are slaves to God and everyone else is a slave to sin. The thrust of this passage is that we should have a posture and attitude of obedience to God rather than an attitude of yielding to sin. The basis of our being slaves of righteousness is our faith in Christ. And then we live out of the status that He bestows on us. And I want you to notice that the strategy that Paul uses for fighting this antinomian tendency to give in to sin is to remind us of who we are in Christ. God has set us free from sin and made us slaves of righteousness. Our status before God is one of perfection because we are united with Christ and are given His righteousness. Our standing in the family of God is based completely on the perfect, pure, untinged holiness of Jesus Christ. And then on the basis of that status, we are exhorted to offer ourselves to righteousness rather than to sin. The motivation for our battle against sin is not to avoid God's wrath because indeed the antinomians are right. In Christ, the wrath of God has been removed because all of that wrath was laid on Christ at the cross. So the wrath of God is no longer our motivation to avoid sin. Now our gratitude toward God for what He has done, our love for God because of what He is doing in our lives is our motivation to fight against sin. In fact, this is one of the reasons that a backsliding believer is so miserable. If you're a believer who's grown cold toward the Lord and you're living in slavery to sin and open rebellion against God, I can guarantee that you're miserable because the Spirit of God within you is struggling against your sinful nature to yield yourself to sin. And if you haven't, excuse me, if you have not come back to the Lord, if you're listening to this right now and you're a backsliding believer, let me urge you and exhort you to confess that to the Lord, receive His forgiveness, and be restored.
If you haven't put your faith in Christ, if you are an unbeliever who is watching, that this, watching this today, then I ask you to do the same thing. Confess your sin to the Lord. Ask His forgiveness. Believe that His death on the cross and resurrection paid the penalty for your sin, and you will be saved. You will be washed. You will be forgiven. You will be adopted. You will be set free from sin and turned into a slave to righteousness. Child of God, you are a slave of God. Don't live like a slave of sin. I've listed a few ways that you can respond to this word from God. You can see them on the slide or the sermon notes on our app. I want to highlight just one of these responses. And that's the third one. Think of one way that you could present yourself as a slave to righteousness this week and do it. A couple of ideas. You could decide, I'm going to pray three days this week. Let's say Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm going to pray for our lead pastor, Todd Malone, and our board of elders. Pray for God to give them wisdom as they work through the timing and the logistics behind resuming public service. Another idea, you could evaluate the shows that you watch on Netflix. Are there any that are leading you to sin? Take those off your list. Put aside this presentation of yourself as a slave to sin and replace it to present yourself as a slave to righteousness. You are slaves to God. Live that way. Do not live as slaves to sin. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of your great Son, Jesus, I come to you and I praise you that your work has given me freedom, that your Son has set me free from sin and made me a slave of righteousness. Lord, I, I recognize how short I fall of living that out every day. And I know that your grace covers me. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would give me the motivation to continue in an attitude of righteousness toward you, an attitude of submission. I pray, God, for everyone who is watching this, that you would work in their hearts with a special measure of grace. For the people of your body, I pray that you would help them to resist that antinomian tendency to just yield to sin. God, for those who don't know you, I pray that your spirit would bring the conviction of their sin and the conviction that Jesus stands ready to save them. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your good news, for your life. In your holy name I pray, amen. God bless you.